Welcome back, everybody, to the seventh Marine Board, European Marine Board Forum um, on Big Data. Uh, we are now um, going to our first session, which is going to be on the European Green Deal. Um, if we can have the next slide, please. Um, so just a reminder about the housekeeping rules, please use chat for any technical support and please put your questions and answers in the Q&A, which you will find at the bottom of the screen. Um, and please remember to put your name, make sure your name is in there and um, please state who the question is for. And then I will hopefully, if we have time, read out the questions to the panelists and speakers. Reminder that this uh, webinar is being recorded um, and live streamed on YouTube. Um, and we will put the recording on YouTube afterwards. Next slide, please. So our first talk uh, of this session, or our only talk of this session actually, is by Jeroen Steenbeek. Uh, Jeroen is uh, the core programmer for the, Euro for the Ecopath Consortium, and he works with a, a MSP challenge um, where he integrates Ecopath with Ecosim into uh, serious gaming. Um, he's got a, a background in software engineering and GIS, and he's now involved with ecosystem modeling. Um, so without further ado, I'll let uh, Jeroen take over. So I think you're going to share your screen and share some slides. Perfect. Thank you, Jeroen. We can't hear you. Does that work? I mean, IT things are difficult. Yes, That's okay. <laughs> yes, that works. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Jeroen, and as Sheila said, I'm one of the core programmers of Ecopath with Ecosim. But I'm going to talk to you in uh, about something else in my capacity as one of the developers of the MSP Challenge Simulation Platform. It's a serious game that we built for policy and towards ecosystem-based fisheries management. Um, the MSP game is it's a very social adventure where multiple participants explore uh, the MSP process um, in order to comply to the new privacy rules I blocked out all the faces in the presentation with an kind of interesting effect, but uh, bear with me. So the MSP, th these are screenshots of the MSP game actually as it is. So there's, an, uh, there's a very digital component to it, but also a huge social component, which is probably much more important. The aim of the MSP Challenge Simulation Platform, or MSP Challenge, as I'll be calling it now briefly in this presentation, is to how to design and apply a serious gaming to support education and execution of maritime spatial planning as a complex decision-making process. So it's basically, the, 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 the aim is to educate and to, and to support the execution through a serious game where multiple players engage, negotiate, and approve spatial plans for a marine area uh, the plans cover a wide range of activities that are currently in place in, in maritime areas. And within the safety of an virtual environment, players can just experiment with different plans without having to implement them in fact. So we, the, the game is uh, largely focused on exploration and learning uh, in order to figure out what kind of things, what, what, what it entails to plan and how plans can conflict and how plans might affect your ecologies in, uh, in society. Uh, how does it work? Well, the MSP is set up uh, to capture uh, all the existing activities in an area uh, and the ecology in the area of interest. And there are now currently uh, games uh, built for the North Sea, the Firth of Clyde, Baltic and others. Um, individual participants take the role of planners into jurisdictions, into some kind of governing body around a given area uh, in teams. So there's multiple teams operating in the same area and of course that creates nice friction. Uh, and they're given each each group is given goals to achieve within the next 30, 40 years. So the planning is from a uh, to be defined status quo into the future. Then participants start about modifying existing activities or plan new ones. Uh, they do that in a desktop application that is basically in a, something similar to C-Sketch or so, where you just uh, you you have an, an canvas where you can draw your plans, and then there's several, several screens where you can refine when your plan comes activity, what it what it entails, etc. The cool thing about it is that uh, it's all about conflict resolution. I mean, imagine, for instance, planning a wind farm off of the harbor, uh, or the exits of the harbor of Antwerp, for instance. That, that wouldn't go well with everybody. So it is, you need to make sure that your plans make sense, that they're allowed, that they're feasible, and that they don't conflict with other activities. Uh, 
planning uh, a mining area in somebody else's shipping line is not a popular thing to do. There's things like uh, some countries may allow to put uh, algal farming within a wind park. Like there's, there's all these kind of factors that people can play with. So, but the information discovery is key. So the MSP challenge also contains a built-in knowledge base where people can explore uh, some background information on the various activities. Then after the planning phase comes a phase where simulations kick in. And during a simulation phase, spatial plan plans come into force over the time that they were approved for. Uh, and the MSP challenge at the moment contains three simulation models, one for shipping, one for ecology, and one for energy. Uh, and those respond to the spatial plans when they come to act, when they become active. And then, of course, at the end of the simulation phase, the outcomes of the simulations are explored by, par by participants for the next planning round as a chance to uh, fix how you messed up, because that's undoubtedly going to happen. Um, the flow of a session of a game is, uh, is displayed on the, as you on the right hand side. Um, say if we're planning for educational purposes this is the layout for an educational game here and you start with an introduction by a moderator uh, about what msp pla uh, planning is get everybody in the right uh, mindset and an in introduction to the software and then for the first three hours people start planning and try to make their goals meet by in the next 30 40 years um, then for lunch break we kick in uh, a simulation phase kicks in where the plans come to life and energy shipping and ecology respond and that gets fed back um, into the next planning phase, which starts with the dissemination round. So, okay, what happened? Like, did everything go as you wanted to? And what are the consequences of your, what you planned? Then everybody will have this, oh my God moment, and we plan again. Um, and then over coffee break, we run another 30 year simulations. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but um, running 30 year simulations in just a coffee break, either you need super long coffee queues or you need to take some shortcuts. And that was what we've done. Uh, on the left hand, it says that the simulations need to run fast, uh, and we cut some short. We, we took some shortcuts, uh, uh, trading off realism versus performance. Because I mean, a full-on energy model, full of shipping, a full-on ecology. Yeah, we need to. Um, well, it needs to be indicative. But there's also another version of the MSP that is now starting to emerge, which is really a decision support tool version, where realism is much more key, and those sessions would take a different format. The simulations are much more detailed uh, and, and, and can take much longer. So we're already seeing now a deviation in different audiences to, that we cater to. The audiences are typically stakeholders or planners or, or people that are just interested in the process, but you could really cater this engine to something that is much more focused on, okay, what will actually happen if I do this? So just uh, to give you an example how we integrated ecology, because this, this is my, my pet peeve, um, all the MSP activities in the area can contribute to one or more environmental pressures. We defined five. Um, so, and those are entered by the, the plans are entered by the MSP player. And the, the planning actions get collected by the server, and those get translated into those pressures that are that are listed on the left. They generate uh, noise or surface disturbance, bottom disturbance. Uh, they generate artificial substrate, maybe or some species that might be very beneficial. And some MSP uh, activities obviously create areas where, there, where fishing is going to be blocked, where it won't be possible. So, and then the ecological model underneath, Ecopath with Ecosim, handles the spatial and temporal interplay of food web, fisheries, and environmental change. And as an example here, for instance, this is from a paper that, if you want to read more about this, I invite you to check the paper that came out this year in, in Ecology and Society. Um, this is a figure from the paper where you see, okay, increase in shipping, generated noise and generated service disturbance, and that had an effect on cetaceans. Um, different functional groups in the ecosystem respond differently as they do in reality. And then the effect of the changing environmental conditions due to people's activities cascade through the food web. And that is you know, just an interesting set of data to consider for players. And that's only ecology. There's also, uh, there's also the shipping itself. There's also energy and, and potentially a whole lack of other factors that you could include. So in order to, to build MSP Challenge, yeah, I, I think reading the five Vs earlier, I think we qualify for big data, but I mean, I would like to avoid buzzwords and just simply explain you what we do. There's a huge amount of data that goes into MSP Challenge in order to parameterize it, parameterize it for an area. Uh, we capture human activities, the environment, there's policy rules and laws to decide what's possible, what needs to be achieved, what, what kind of regulations apply for different regions, etc. cetera. Um, 
and especially if we start looking into uh, another aspect that we've been considering is to, to make this real digital twin where we bring in live data, observational data or some near real-time data to into an MSP session prior to its start to make sure that we capture, um, we basically, uh, yeah, we, we capture the situation that is right now. Again, that, that pushes the, the game into a very, you know, tangible, real uh, scenario where feelings at stake, personal aims are at stake. So it depends how you want to play the game, but that's an option that we have. And there's also a huge potential for artificial intelligence here, or maybe even smart analysis. Uh, for instance, bringing in this data, bringing in automated data, data for, to feed a digital twin, that data needs to be brought in and quality checked and checked for realism, et cetera. And that's where we could, that's where we could play with AI. But there's also, for instance, a huge potential for uh, understanding why players make certain decisions with what kind of data, just to understand the decision process, the mechanistics of the decision process better. So tons of things that we could, could further play with. Speaking about developments, um, yeah, we're doing, this, the platform is heavily under development. We're now uh, bringing in, uh, scoping how to bring in marine currents, climate, climate variability. Uh, we're going to play with litter and pollution and how you can clean it up. Uh, we want to expand the fisheries model. We want to bring in better socioeconomics uh, and certain testing, especially for policy advice. That is very necessary because uncertainty is rife. So there we can. There are several things we can do. But as always, the whole idea is to okay, keep focused on what what you want to do with this game. Who do you who are you talking to? Stakeholders, uh, okay, people that want to learn about the MSP process itself don't care about all these, these side factors. And in that sense, you need to keep your messages clear. And that is a whole challenge by itself, the challenge within the challenge. Uh, so yeah, what do you want to do with it? This uh, building the game, do you have all the data that, that, that you need to build an MSP game? Is, all it, is some data classified, maybe a whole in governmental uh, organizations or maybe in formats you can deal with this. So that's the, the building of MSP challenge. The scope challenge is that how you want to apply the game and yeah, and the usability challenges, yeah. You don't want to bury users into inf in information, but you want to keep the story clear. So interesting challenges uh, while building this tool. Uh, I invite you to check it out. Uh, the MSP challenges, uh, you can download it and play it by yourself. Uh, go to mspchallenge.info. Uh, we currently have three games available that you can play with. The North Sea, the Fred of Clyde and the Baltic, and there's an Adriatic uh, in the development and others in the planning. Um, soon, the development will be to open source, access to all the source code, which is uh, fun. And uh, it will be community driven. So that is a 10 minute version of something I could talk about for hours. I hope this was somewhat useful. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have questions, please uh, get involved. Okay, bye. Thank you very much, Jeroen. Um, so wonderful. I see nobody's had any questions, which really surprises me because I have a question as you will. Oh, no, hold on. There's a question. Um, drat, I can't ask my own question now. Okay, Jeroen, <laughs> this is from Ann-Kathrine de Schauard. I Sorry, Ann-Kathrine, I cannot pronounce your last name. Um, so bringing in near real-term data also brings in variability. So seasonality, spatial variability in the decision-making process. How does the MSP challenge deal with this um, and as a mechanism between the players and stakeholders? Well, right now we don't, we're scoping this. Uh, as I said earlier, we, we, we're trying to bring in the environment to change, but it should be to be feasible. Uh, we have several decisions there. I mean, the aim of the MSP game before was to, uh, you don't want to have factors influencing your game that are out of player's control. That was the whole idea, because I mean, you want F we, I do this, so that happens, cause and cause and effect. That, that, that is for learning. If you start, making the climate vary, then people are like, yeah, I don't do anything. If something goes to hell, what can I, you know, what, what's my role? So that is a real strong consideration. You need to figure out what you want to do. Um, but we definitely can bring in time ticking maps of, of currents, of nutrients, of salinity, of pH, of pollution, etc. cetera. Um, then there's the argument, okay, does, for instance, do MSP activities change the current? If you put a big island in, you, 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 you make the whole doggers bank an island, yeah, of course, then the currents are going to change. So do we compute it ourselves? Can that still work in a, in, in, during a coffee break? Can that still run? Or do we necessarily need a month <laughs> of, of break? I mean, so all these factors need to be considered. The fact that the ecosystem model can bring, 
can accept all these things does not mean that platos can conceptually maintain it all contain it. so that's an ongoing discussion but it is feasible but it's the challenge is more how yeah, that's a great question okay then we have one more question that i'm going to ask uh, and then I, I don't think we can use we can ask all of them because we're going to run out of time we might come back to them at the end um, the question from Carlos Tiga is, what technologies are you using? He's from the Insight Center for Data Analytics, so I'm ah, sure very, he's very interested. <laughs> very good. No, we, we should talk. We can talk separately. <laughs> but uh, no, Ecopath is, uh, this is based on Unity, the whole MSP challenge, and Unity is c uh, .net, and, uh, and Ecopath is also .net. So the two are, the marriage was easy in that part. Uh, but I mean, it will be wrapped in, in Python, the MSP game. We want to be able to play it on, on web browsers. I mean, that's all, it's, it's just plumbing. So it's, it's all quite, it's quite straightforward. The data processing and all that, yeah, that's a whole different story. There's a lot of QA on forehand for building a session. The, the, the manual process is huge. That we like to automate that. But the platforms are mostly .NET and .NET is becoming now truly in, uh, operating system independent. So life is quite okay. Thank you, Jeroen. Um, okay, I am going to in the in the for time, or maybe I'll ask Pierre Luigi's question anyway. We're going to be late anyway. Okay, so one last question um, from Pierre Luigi Botiget. Oh, sorry, <laughs> he's from the Helmholtz Metadata Collaboration. Uh, he's asking uh, prior, prioritizing information for dashboard, dashboards is a considerable challenge. Are you engaging expertise from phys, um, from psychology and decision-making for the design process? That's a great question. Yeah, that's a super question. What uh, interesting, this, this game is built uh, by the Brita University of Applied Sciences, and they have game developers from all over the world that teach. So that expertise is fantastic. These guys have experienced what works in simulation games, you know, uh, civilization, uh, age of empires, all these other things, and the sim and 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 the Sims. So yes, there are there is definitely a wide involvement of stakeholders, ranging from ecology to economists to technical experts. Like what what kind of efficiency does this you know, wind turbine have? All these kind of things. Um, so the the amount of information, the amount of expertise we bring in is huge, and there is a lot of prototyping with user interface to see okay, what works, what doesn't. Like do we use tra tra traffic lights versus uh, time plots versus indicators versus, and different audiences also need, also need different things. So there's also not one user interface. You can turn things on or off basically based on who we're talking to. You need to have some flexibility here. I mean, yeah, different people want to see different things. And the challenge under all of that is to, to keep it intuitive, keep the user interface clean and simple without drowning people in options. So. <laughs> it, that's it. playing the game is a challenge already, as you can understand, or building it at least. We try to keep the challenge of playing it as low as possible, but uh, I'm happy to discuss this further. Yeah, so I think if anybody else has any more questions, please put them in the uh, question and answer. And um, for the whole day, if there's any questions that stays unanswered, we will definitely answer them uh, uh, if we can live. Otherwise, we will um, collect them and, and give you the answers later via email. But we will also put these up on our LinkedIn page if you were interested. Beautiful. So, thank you. Okay, can we share the presentations? If people yes, are interested, I'm happy to share this. Yeah. We will definitely share the presentations. Okay, um, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Arun. So now we will go to the um, uh, our panel discussion. And for our panel discussion today, we have uh, four panelists. I'm going to introduce them uh, one by one and ask them a question just because otherwise we're going to run out of time. Uh, and the first question is going to go to Felix Leinemann. He is uh, the head of unit for the DG Mare's Blue Economy Sectors, Aquaculture and Maritime Spatial Planning. Um, you can see why we picked him for this session. It's, uh, it all fits very well together uh, with the European Green Deal. So my question for you, Felix, and I'm not, at the moment, I'm not really seeing if I'm seeing you. Are you there? Yes, you're there. Excellent. Um, my question for you is, uh, what are the most uh, pressing questions that need to be answered from the uh, Green Deal that big data and artificial intelligence, intelligence can help answer? Okay, yeah, good morning, everyone, and, and thanks for the question. I, I would have loved to listen more to, to you, but um, I think maritime spatial planning is certainly one of the areas where you have these, uh, where we can try to answer these questions and with artificial intelligence and big data. The first, I, 
I'm not an expert in, in all this, um, but I'm certain that artificial intelligence can contribute. And the Green Deal leaves us with a lot of questions actually, but I will focus on two. The first big question comes from the need to upscale marine renewable energy so that it can raise its contribution to the EU's electricity production from the current share of 2% to uh, 25 or even 35% by 2050. This means that we will need to produce 25 times as much energy from the sea as today in the EU waters. What are the consequences of that for our maritime space? And how can we ensure that uh, vulnerable marine ecosystems uh, are adequately protected? We have the EU's biodiversity strategy that calls for the expansion of the EU's network of protected areas from 11 to 30% also at sea. And we need a much better understanding of the potential cumulative impacts on the marine environment and the interaction between offshore renewables and other activities at sea, like fisheries, aquaculture, or shipping. The second question that I would put here is the potential of seaweed cultivation, which is a very specific question. Seaweed has many different applications from food to feed to pharmaceuticals, biostimulants, fertilizers, and it can also provide climate related and other ecosystem services. We know that if we expand the production of shellfish and seaweed, we can relieve the pressure on increasingly scarce land resources. We know that they feed on the nutrients that harm our marine ecosystems. And we know that the increasing construction of offshore wind farms will offer space for this to happen. But what we don't know exactly, what are the limits? What are the most suitable sites? And what other impact could this have then on ecosystems? So those are two pressing questions that I would see uh, we would need to answer uh, quite soon. Thank you very much, Felix. Uh, okay, uh, the next question is going to go to Antonia Leroy. She is the head of ocean policy at WWF Europe, uh, European Policy Office. Um, and she's an expert in ocean governance and has worked uh, uh, for many years with IUU fishing. Um, so my question to you, Antonia, is um, how can big data enable a more equitable way of working between industries for efficient use of marine space? Thanks for the question and good morning, everyone. Um, well, I will say that big data has first allows us to visualize and understand what was happening there at sea. So it gave uh, access to information to all stakeholders on the sea use and as mentioned by uh, the previous um, speaker on the CUs and the cumulative pressure of human activities that have on sea biodiversity, but also I think to identify potential conflict between users. We already see that uh, with the aim to increase offshore wind farm with fisheries, there might be conflict. So it's important to map um, the sea areas. And I think assessing this kind of uh, data publicly uh, definitely help to improve uh, transparency by making more informed and equitable decisions on policy files. Um, data can be looked at from an economic uh, perspective, but we also need to look from an environmental impact consideration, especially with the European Green Deal and the 30% aspiration of marine protected area by 2030. And in addition, I, I want to mention um, that this fact this kind of technologies has already allowed us to create a more level playing field um, between stakeholders. For instance, um, it allowed us to identify the, um, illegal activities at sea, such, such as uh, illegal fishing, and, um, and it brings some improvement in terms of equity where surveillance and monitoring at sea are costly and to really put stakeholders on the same line. So yes, to conclude, um, to increase the value of the wealth of marine big data, it must be openly shared from it to be equitable and become integrating into complex trans dis sorry, trans disciplinary, um, let's say, analysis and file. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, our third panelist is a clear Pasadistas. Sorry, pronunciation, terrible. Uh, she's a PhD student at the Flanders Marine Institute and, and University of Ghent, um, and her work focuses on, on the marine soundscape characterization and the use, use of big data um, in that sense. Um, she's got a, a background in industrial engineering with specialization in um, automatics and robotics. So, Clea, my question to you, as a young scientist, so thank you for joining us as a young scientist, what do you see as, um, as the biggest challenge the Green Deal will face um, that you think big data and artificial intelligence can overcome? 
So, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if it's the biggest challenge, but uh, the one that I'm aware of, uh, and I would speak a bit more globally, not uh, of, about specific topics, is I think it's making accurate predictions for not seen scenarios and, and some actions that have never happened. And I think um, this is very important for good management. Uh, and this can only be done if we model and understand what's going on, understand the effects that certain actions can have. And uh, this can only be done using AI because sometimes it goes beyond what hu we humans understand. Uh, it's not a straightforward uh, correlation, so we need like more complex model or neural networks that can actually understand the interactions of two complex systems. And I think uh, the biggest challenge to do that is the data acquisition that Linward uh, mentioned before, uh, because uh, acquiring data at sea is very complicated. It's a very challenging and dynamic environment. And it's also not, access, not very accessible to humans. And even though new technologies are now raising to get more uh, sp spatially distributed data and continuous data, and this is generating big data that's going to be good for modeling uh, using AI, it's always, it can always be biased and then can always lead to error. So I think we really have to put an effort on how we acquire these data and how we, how we store it so we can actually uh, train our models and then get accurate predictions. And as he mentioned also before Linward, we have to keep in mind that it might be wrong. So just uh, keep testing what we develop every time. Wonderful, thank you very much. And our last panelist is um, Andre Sukuka. Um, Andre, there we go, we see you. Um, so he is the Public Policy and Government Affairs Manager at Google Europe. Um, and he has got a background in EU policy, international public affairs, business administration, economics, and online marketing and communication. Um, and my question to you, Andre, is what is the role of big tech in advan uh, achieving the European Green Deal? Thank you very much uh, for question and uh, good morning, first of all, everyone. Let me start with uh, first uh, stating that uh, we as a Google support European ambitious plans on sustainability and we believe that the role of companies and technology is important in achieving those and artificial intelligence is uh, and machine learning is a critical tool for addressing these uh, big challenges. Uh, let me uh, tell uh, uh, two points. One is about what do we do? And then uh, secondly, uh, what I think what we see are some technological opportunities to achieving this um, uh, sustainability goals. So in terms of what do we do, uh, I'm very glad that our European president, Matt Britton, in October has endorsed uh, council discussions uh, towards uh, climate neutral EU by 2050. And in that sense, we have also committed to uh, doing three things. What can we do? Uh, and, and that is basically we have committed to operating our business uh, entirely on carbon free energy uh, by 2030. Uh, of course, starting by us as a company, but we, then we also think about how to support others around especially businesses and partners to increase their energy efficiency. And uh, we do that, for example, by uh, purchasing uh, a renewable energy project uh, in a value of 1 billion in the Northern Europe, but also uh, funding uh, science-based uh, reforestation programs uh, and um, uh, by providing users and 1 billion people uh, information and tools to take action and reduce their environmental footprint uh, by 2020. So this is all done by both enabling the data sets, sharing and enabling it for, for use, and also by, um, in our case, it's a Google Cloud, uh, which is a technology that allows you to tap into the AI um, expertise without actually need of knowing the technical details. And then the last one is the uh, ecosystem where uh, we are, for example, using an environment, environmental insights explorer, which is a tool based on Google Maps and Earth. Uh, and this allows for more than 500 cities across Europe uh, to understand uh, where, what are the sources of carbon, uh, 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 carbon emissions in their city and reduce it and target the areas where they need to. Now, going to the second part, where we think the technology can be further used, 
uh, the the kind of three main areas where we see uh, the application of AI leads to uh, sustainability uh, benefits. The first one is, I think, taking uh, better care of existing resources. Uh, and, and that is, for example, optimizing grids, uh, saving energy in data centers, but also, as Antonia has said, uh, for example, preventing or monitoring illegal fishing, where we are partners to Global uh, Fishing Watch. In that sense, I also want to point you to a colleague of mine, Julie Catio, and her. Uh, she has done a phenomenal research around whale songs. This, this project will be possibly shared also after this conference. And otherwise, you can find it online. And this is some of the great example of how AI can be used and the data set can be then shared for a wider research community. And we expect many more innovative ideas uh, coming from that. The second is uh, discovery of new materials and processes where, for example, when thinking about solar cell materials or uh, building uh, value of the wind energy, so the second area where we think the, the AI is really, really contributing is the discovery of these materials. And the third one is adaptation to new conditions, such as, for example, flood forecasting. So to sum up, uh, we as a company have committed and support these ambitious goals. And we believe that AI as a technology is a great tool that can help us as a society to achieve those ambitious goals. Thank you very much, Andre. Um, so, and I will I will just say that the, he mentioned uh, the whale song uh, uh, video. Uh, we will send a link to that uh, in our kind of follow up email to everybody who attended this webinar. So you will you will see, it, and I, I think we'll also have it on our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, so uh, you've all now met all of our panelists. So if you have any questions for them, please put it in the question and answer. I'm sure we will have time for questions. Um, after my next round of questions. So we've got some more pre-prepared questions, um, but then I would like to have some coming from the audience, if I may. Uh, so my next round of questions, I'll ask first to Felix again. Um, how can big data and digital innovation help to overcome challenges related to the efficient use of maritime space? Okay, I will get back to maritime spatial planning as, as you uh, rightly point out. Um, I mentioned the need to upscale uh, our energy um, production at sea. And uh, on 18 November, the European Commission will come forward with an offshore renewable energy strategy, uh, trying to lay out uh, all the things that need to be uh, done to, to come up with this uh, upscaling. And among other things, we will look at the ex expanding the possibility of multiple combined uses of the maritime space. Um, I already mentioned the possibility of growing seaweed or mollusks between offshore wind turbines, for example, but there's more. How can we avoid real life risks, for example? For the moment, the, the areas with the highest potential for offshore renewable energy are, are also those which are most exposed to risks, like collisions with vessels, fishing gear, military activities, or even dumped ammunition and, and chemicals. Um, recently, a, a bomb uh, exploded of the Polish coast, for example, where, where uh, quite a number of wind parks are planned for the next uh, in the next decade, and those are bombs from World War One or Two, which have been there for for many many years. And you also know, being in Ostend, uh, that there is a site uh, in front of the Belgian coast where where nobody is allowed to go. So those are things. How can we know these risks? How can we mitigate them? We will need. To in another uh, area, I think with regard to efficient use of the space, we will need to look at the regional level and the sea basin level. For the moment, planning happens in national waters and uh, there is cross-border cooperation, but we don't have a regional approach. And um, this is uh, not only to set up the energy systems that which work across, work across borders, but also to keep the ecosystems intact. A lot of data have already been collected in various projects that we've been funding under the European Maritime Fisheries Fund in cross-border and sea basin uh, cooperation. But all these data are still scattered and we have put in place a, a working group on data for maritime spatial planning with scientists, practitioners, member state experts to see how we can best use all these data. Structures like Emotnet that was mentioned by Andrea uh, earlier today are certainly helping. but. Imutnet is not complete and there's still a lot of uh, use that we can make of this. 
Thank you very much, Felix. Okay, so um, my next question for Antonia is, how can big data and digital innovation contribute to the sustainable use of marine resources? Thanks, Ella. Um, yeah, for this one, I thought I could give a concrete example of an ongoing discussion at the EU level on the revision of the fisheries control regulation currently under negotiation. Um, because do you know uh, what is the most common type of infringement in fisheries, for instance? Um, so it's not fulfilling the obligation to record and report catch uh, or catch-related data, including data to be transmitted by a uh, site uh, vessel monitoring system. And one out of six fish in our plate are caught illegally. So we need to improve traceability and transparency along the value chain. This is the old discussion about catch that is currently happening, which is a system to, um, to make catch certificate electronic and hoping it is adopted. Um, so the data collected um, and digital innovation can definitively contribute uh, to the sustainable use of our resourcing uh, by informing consumers about what is in their plate and increasingly economical for fisheries management authorities because today the catch certificate is paper-based and we need to move to our electronic system all around the world, making all the cash documentation scheme information available and to have the, also the possibility to cross-check data because currently paper um, is a bit slow and lab labor intensive. Um, it's, there is confusion over documentation requirement for operator and is prone to fraud. Uh, length of time between incident and discovery of incident also um, is too long, and there is, a, there is a risk of data desynchronization. So an electronic system can definitively um, increase efficiency, um, connect all actors along the supply chain, uh, improve also um, you know, the social uh, condition, uh, food and health and safety, and risk monitoring, etc. So there is really benefit of having electronic system and as in maybe um, an artificial intelligence that can gather and cross-check all data. So, um, but just to conclude and to have a point on that, um, I think we cannot use big data without having um, a proper regulate, regulatory structures in place. Otherwise, it doesn't matter how good, um, you know, you can bring evidence and tracking um, with your new technologies, if nothing could be implemented on first after. So I will just want to end on this point. Thanks. Yeah, it's a very good point. Thank you very much, Antonio. Um, okay, then my next question for Clea is, um, how do you think can big data and artificial intelligence contribute to addressing underwater noise levels uh, for good environmental status under the Marine Strategy Framework Directive? I know that's something that you're just um, working on on your PhD, so I thought we'd ask you something that's uh, very related. Yeah. Um... So, uh, for the, uh, as, a, as the 11th descriptor of good environmental status, there is noise and energy. And, and to assess the good environmental status levels of noise, it's necessary to understand how noise is affecting uh, the marine life. So, we need to first understand which noise is being uh, contributed by anthropogenic noise, which is already an unanswered question. And we then need to understand how this noise is affecting the marine population. Uh, population levels also individuals and to do that it's necessary to um, link these two things uh, so anthropogenic activities which noise they produce and then we need acoustic models and and then they propagate these acoustic models and try to see if we get any response on the marine life and this is to do that it's a lot of data because sound at sampling rates that exist right now the technology is available it's very high and it produces a terabytes and terabytes of data and also to link the two connections. But uh, furthermore, I think uh, sound can also give information not only on these uh, noise levels that are good, yeah, that are considered for a good um, environment status, but can also give information about biodiversity and also give information about what's going on in the marine life. Because in underwater, uh, sound propagates much better than light because light is strongly uh, absorbed and scattered. And there are even some, some marine environments where light actually doesn't go through. So animals use uh, mainly sound to get the information about their surroundings. And, and I think we can use this information also that's just there on the environment, but we can record it. And then we can also use to assess other uh, interesting things um, 
as a good environmental set that we can read biodiversity levels and we can read um, other information about what's going on in the on the on the environment only by listening to the sound. Thank you very much. I um, I'm going to use my chair's privilege to add here uh, that actually um, I know when I was working in Scotland they were specifically looking at the the sound that's produced um, by underwater turbines, for instance, and and whether marine mammals will be able to hear them and avoid them, for instance. And that was really interesting because they were looking at the soundscapes in the places where they were putting these turbines and it was a super noisy area. And so they were worried that the mammals wouldn't hear the turbines in order to avoid the turbines, which was completely different to the, the problem we know about sound all the time. So I was just gonna add that little bit as a, the sound thing is not as easy as just, we need to be quiet. Um, okay, then my next question to Andre is, um, what lessons can the marine science community learn from the tech industry? And um, obviously, because you guys are more advanced in big data and artificial intelligence. So how do you think our scientists can do it better? Well, I would be very respectful here and very humble uh, because my background is primarily policy and I will try to breach the both. Uh, th th there are three points I thought were, would be trying to answer your question. The first one is that it's important to be aware that the AI itself as a technology is a tool and it will not fix uh, or automatically resolve the the big, for example, climate change or our maritime research questions. Uh, where we see, however, uh, the, that, that what we see is that when experts from different fields including the experts on AI, sit together and collaborate together, they are more likely to succeed or find a breakthrough or find a different way of looking at, at the same problem. And we have seen that uh, work uh, in, in some of the kind of long-term ideas, such as uh, fusion energy, but uh, we have also seen some shorter term uh, mitigations, uh, climate mitigations or adaptations, for example, in the flood, flood uh, forecasting. So I think that the, the, the first message is that the, the, the lesson learned is that the, the path forward is to work together experts from different fields. Uh, and, and in order to do that, for example, we have launched a dedicated a uh, grant program for researchers, communities, it's called AI for Social Good. Uh, and if we speak about climate change, it's specifically about Google AI impact challenge on, on tackling climate change. So that is one example where we try to encourage researchers and other experts coming together, providing uh, some grants and uh, technical support. The second is uh, the, the, the message is that, that, uh, that AI has potential uh, to 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 empower government scientists and companies and consumers uh, working together on those sustainability goals, and an important component of that is sharing the the data sets, exchanging the data sets, benefiting from the technology tools that are already already available. Again, uh, for example, in our case, it's the cloud AI analytics, and and working uh, together. Uh, towards some common standards that can uh, help with uh, with uh, regards to innovation, uh, and and here as again I will come to uh, one point which I raised before, which is governments have uh, an important role here, uh, and 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 uh, through that support of better uh, forecasting, uh, better prediction uh, of outcomes, we believe that uh, that 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 can bring tangible. Uh, solutions also to the maritime or uh, expert community in general. Uh, also, consumers and, and citizens being better informed about ways how they can individually uh, stay informed and take a, a decision, that decision that is uh, contributing to, to a bigger goal is equally important. And that is something which we are thinking a lot, how to develop tool, tools that allow individual users to be better informed uh, and then take uh, those decisions. And my last point here is that that governments uh, play a crucial role by, by also setting the reg overall regulatory environment uh, and, and, and also uh, setting the boundaries and rules for developing AI in a, in a responsible way. 
Uh, I think one of the key objectives for the governments and for these regulatory schemes should be to basically uh, boost public trust in AI while recognizing there needs to be a balance between the societal benefits and potential harms. Uh, we, in this sense, um, stand for, um, for a risk-based approach, which is that the regulation should, of course, aim to find this balance, but should also keep in mind the, the considerations of opportunity of not using, opportunity cost of not using AI, for example, for tackling some of our biggest societal challenges, or uh, for the emphasis for need for proportion, proportionality, uh, which in, 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 in the research world could mean that not just being aware of the risks of the harm, but also of the probability of those harms uh, happening. And we are trying to also contribute here. My last point here is that our uh, we have a dedicated team uh, of, of researchers who have put together a, um, a responsible AI practices, which is a publicly accessible, and where we just share our experience of uh, working and developing uh, the AI tools in, in a responsible manner, manner, making sure that the privacy, fairness, interpretability, and safety are at the core. And so others can look at it, uh, and research communities can look at it and, and maybe see what of those um, uh, case studies and examples can be also applied for their work. Thank you very much. So that's been really interesting. I think there's a few questions that have come in. I know there's still one for Jeroen, but I'm going to take these to the panel first, and then I'm going to ask the question to Jeroen. Uh, the first uh, question is again from Pierluigi, whose last name I cannot pronounce. Um, and it's about machine learning. Um, machine learning based artificial intelligence can easily be poisoned by bad data. So what strategies are being taken to make sure that the data isn't just big, but informative and trustworthy? Um, and he says, this is a major concern for the UN Ocean Decade Digital Ecosystem Engineering work. Um, so it's a good question. I don't know, it's not asked to anybody. Um, I don't know if anybody wants from the panel or this morning's panel, if they there want to answer this. I know that that's something that um, Linwood also highlighted as a problem. Um, if nobody wants to have a go, I might give a, f I might, well, let me, let me put my crazy idea out there first and then you guys can be serious. I was actually thinking about, um, I think it was Antonio who had mentioned that you could use big data and, and it came out in our big data document that you could use big data to, to identify fish, for instance. And I was kind of thinking about the fact that maybe the ability to identify fish better will help with the problems that they have with identifying you know, people of color. So I know that the, the facial recognition software is really bad at people of color. So maybe if they do more work on fish, they'll get better at getting, you know, identifying people of color, for instance. Um, so uh, Andre, you wanted to answer the questions more seriously. <laughs> yes, uh, I, would, I, I wouldn't say I wanted to answer fully the question, but one thing I wanted to point uh, as, a, as a resource again is um, a, an initiative because we have done a lot of work on the uh, uh, exactly on 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 the speed uh, on the data patterns recognition and um, a, i wanted to bring to your attention the initiative which is called pair people and ai research uh, all of their um, tools are available online and some of the particular pieces of the research uh, tools are actually uh, allowing the researchers uh, to uh, uh, look at the um, uh, that you know for example the the what the, the what if tool or facets uh, these are the tools that are uh, allowing the work of researchers to look at big data sets and spot certain trends uh, or problematic areas in a very easy uh, way uh, and um, so I just wanted to call out that those the question is calling really to important questions and a lot of research has been done and several tools have, are available there for the researchers. So please, again, if you remember, pair people and AI research initiative with Google, uh, uh, check out the tools that are available there. And if you see something missing or some ways how to even improve it, we would be glad to hear back from you. Um, Andre, do you want to put that website in the chat uh, to everybody or in the question and answer so people can get that? That'd be great. I will um, do that. I, 
Excellent. And I, I think Felix has asked, um, what is bad data, right? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna have a go and see if, if anybody else uh, can can agree with that. For me, I think bad data is is beta, data that's based on preconceived ideas. So you know, if you're only if you're only training your AI on white faces, then you're going to be very bad at recognizing faces of color. That I think is what is meant by bad data. Um, maybe I'm wrong, and Pierre Luigi can let us know in the in the chat if if that's wrong. Does anybody else want to have a go with that question? Uh, if maybe not, yeah, Antonia, go. Maybe I, I don't want to answer the question, but maybe uh, ask another question related to this question, because um, I'm not a uh, uh, EAP specialist, but wondering if this bad data, uh, you know, when there is an artificial intelligence, if there can be, I don't know, an algorithm or something that, you know, point out when there is inconsistency in data. So maybe a question for the scientist. Because they could be, of course, but I think it's still better than just paper-based, you know, uh, exchange of information and stuff like that. Yeah, but I think data uh, can be considered that depending on the project or depending on the objective that you're applying it to. So it's maybe bad data for a certain project that you were mentioning, uh, white faces and colored faces. Uh, but if you are only, if your your problem is recognizing white faces, then it is not by data. If your problem is recognizing human faces, then it's by data. But just depending on how you tackle your problem, I think it's going to be by data or good data. Yeah, so maybe the question is bad in that case. <laughs> okay, so we'll go to the next question that we have. Um, it's from Anna. Akimova, and she asks, um, are we t um, talking about gaining new data? Um, but to understand climate rate variability, we need to rely, oh, hold on, we need to rely on long-term or historical data, which are often even not digitized. Uh, can we use new technologies like AI to process their data, and are there such initiatives? Um, I see Andre is shaking his head, so maybe he wants to say something about this. Absolutely, yes, there are uh, technological solutions. Um, we have, for example, done a project around uh, scanning books. And I think that especially the, 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 the visuals, text recognition capabilities of technology are very advanced and can be deployed. I would only um, point out that uh, with regard to this data, uh, a large data sets the technological tools always have to be deployed uh, in in while re while respecting certain uh, regulatory frameworks and i think that remains to be kind of defined and clarified so i think that there are technological solutions but how to use them so that the privacy uh, is respected uh, so that the kind of the, the it, it calls also for regulatory uh, frameworks to specify very clearly uh, how research community can use those data sets. I think that was kind of our experience. But once there is a clarity, I think that technologically there are uh, great, um, great tools available. Um, thank you, Andre. And I think Clea also wanted to answer that question. If you want to have a go, Clea. Yeah, no, I, I was just uh, going to mention an example because I know at UGAMS that I work, there is a specific uh, working group on that, but it's text and knowledge group. And it's uh, mainly based on exploring old papers, trying to get the biological data out of it. So um, it gives very interesting information. Thank you. Um, and I think Pierre Luigi came back with a, a rebuttal on the uh, response from Antonio in the chat. And he says, uh, there can be algorithms to identify data, but we, we need a large collection of consistent, comparable, and interoperable baseline good data for a given application um, with definitions out with defined outcomes. So that would be a good priority area uh, to direct funding and attention, he says. Um, okay, then we have another question um, from Andre. Um, when you when your analysis become when does your analysis become big data analysis? Are we already there without being aware? using products of data initiatives such as eModNet, Copernicus, EU Data Portal, and Inspire. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to have a go, but I might just say that 
we certainly had a lot of discussion on that when we were when we were working on the big data um, um, sort of document. And basically, if you remember from this morning that you know big data it has to have the volume, the veracity, all of the four Vs. Um, and and one of the things we found in that document is that actually in marine science at least we're not really doing so much big data yet. We're doing large quantities of data. We're doing quite often very um, very sort of the, the data is very varied, um, but it's not actually coming yet to the to the that critical mass where you're going to be doing the big data analytics where you're using artificial neural networks that kind of thing. Um, so that's kind of where we are. I don't know if Andre or if any of the other panelists want to address that or even anybody from this morning, if you're still there. No? Andre? I would again point to the resource I have uh, shared in the chat, chat with everyone. I think, please have a look. And I think many of the tools and resources there are trying to address exactly the the, the points that you are raising your question. Thank you. Um, and then I'm going to go back to the question that Anna had for Jeroen. Jeroen, are you there? I can't see you and I can't hear you. Yes, I am. Yes. So the question for you were from Anna Akimova was, um, thank you for the nice talk. Can you imagine a feedback from the model to the data collection strategy, like identifying critical data gaps, resolution issues? Um, and do you have an example? Yeah, I, I placed answers in, answer in the chat. I think this is, uh, if I understand the question correctly, um, I think that data gaps are mostly identified in collecting the data to build MSP games, that that's where you have this, this problem. I mean, and then data scoping together with feature scoping is, of course, necessary every time you start a new MSP game. We, we, we have strategies for making sure that we have the data to build the features that we request. But uh, once the game is in progress, when the game is finished, and the finishing game takes about a year, then the only data gaps are basically the user's knowledge. I hope that, that answers. Yeah. Um, I will say that um, at least from a modeling perspective, because that's my background, for sure modeling is often used to show where the biggest data gaps are in general. Um, so yeah, maybe maybe um, you could even just use the, the ecosystem models in general to look at where the data gaps are, where, you know, if you have good data in one place, you will be able to constrain something better than if you didn't have any data or if you just had data once every five years instead of once a month. Um, those kind of things is, is you can you can test that in a scenario testing way, um, with models. But, but I do think that data availability is one of the big bottlenecks to basically any kind of care. I mean, is the data there in a format that you use? Is it aggregated to the way that you need it or too aggregated for it to be useful? Is it public domain? Is it not hidden by some unit, some governmental body? It's just a, an aspect that's that's for any interdisciplinary approach. It's just a mad mix sometimes. Jeroen, we don't hear you very well. Maybe you can move your thing in. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Claudia. Yeah, I was not the best for talking anymore. Good. Thanks. No, but um, so you, did you hear that answer? I think, yeah. Uh, good. Yeah. I mean, I think I think you're right. And, and that is definitely, again, from a modeling perspective, the biggest problem in modeling is actually just getting the data, as uh, I think um, Natalia was saying this morning, getting the data in the right format is often 90% of the time is basically trying to find the data, making sure you can download the data, getting the data in the right format, the right units, blah, blah, blah. All of these things don't go away. Um, and it certainly becomes even harder with big data because you're not seeing your data as much uh, with big data. You're often assuming that the, that the software is reading something and then it might be reading something else. So I think there's, it, it multiplies the, the, painfulness of getting the right data in the right format if you're wanting to do it in big data. Um, Andre, I see your face, so I'm assuming that you um, want to respond. We can't hear you. Yes, uh, Sheila, just to support uh, your, your last comment. Uh, indeed, I think we are moving, uh, and the research community is demonstrating that we are moving from this notion that it's about the quantity of the data that you need 
in order to do uh, groundbreaking research because it's exactly a lot of efforts is needed to clean structure uh, the data properly. And rather the AI, we see the technology enabling, for example, uh, ways how to uh, predict or how to use uh, a smaller data set uh, to uh, then uh, you know, predict or, or, or scale potential impact um, assess or predict their uh, or, or spot patterns. So indeed, it is, I think, more about uh, the good quality proper structure uh, data set uh, in a good quali high quality and being able to work with those rather than um, uh, believing and hoping and aiming for these endless big uh, sets of data which again oftentimes uh, cause the attention of uh, researchers and those who work with to, to be spent on things which are actually not leading, driving the innovation, but are just maintaining uh, the, the points of data. So I agree with you there. Thank you very much. So I think that uh, covers all the questions that we have. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that, and, and I think we're on time for a change. Um, so I, I think if anybody wants to have a, a last word from the panel, you can. Uh, anybody? Otherwise, I would just say thank you. Felix, did you want to say something? No? no? Okay. Uh, so anybody clear? Antonia, anything? No? Andre? No. All right. So thank you very much. It's been a really great discussion. It's always good to, to get into the nitty gritty and talk about data. Um, and I will just say thank you again. And we will, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we'll go to the next slide now, um, which will tell you that we will have a lunch break and you can all go and have your own lunch. Sadly, you won't be having the wonderful lunch we were planning to have at, at Blue Point. Um, and uh, we will be playing some videos from the um, working group on big data and marine science. We had a webinar on that earlier this year and we had some videos that was made on the specific um, chapters. So if you want to uh, have dinner in a movie or lunch in a movie, you can watch these um, videos now. Um, they'll be, I think, for about 40 minutes or so. Um, and then uh, if we can at about 20 to 2, if the people for the afternoon session can be there just so that we can check that we can hear and see you before this and the next session starts at 2 o'clock um, uh, Brussels time. So thank you very much. Uh, have a wonderful lunch and enjoy the videos. I found them uh, very informative. Thank you very much.